welcome to church. So last week, I asked you a question. Can you remember what it was? I asked you, what do you think the most important word in the Bible is? Can you remember? And we said that you would most likely think of the name of God or Jesus Christ. But that is a name. If you can summarize the whole Bible in one word, one word, what would that be? What is the Bible all about? What is the message of the Bible all about? Yes, you would think of the reason Jesus came to earth to die for our sins. After all, the message of the coming Messiah starts in Genesis. But what is the dying of the Messiah all about? If we summarize the message of the Bible in one word, what is God all about? Holiness? Yes. Love? Yes. But there's another word that sums up the whole message of the Bible and tells us about God himself. Grace. Grace is the one word that describes it all. Never throughout history, since the beginning of mankind or the beginning of creation, could salvation be deserved or earned by doing good works. Neither could it be earned by obeying all the laws of God or keeping His commandments. We will never be good enough for heaven by ourselves. God is holy. He is too holy for us to be let into His presence by just trying to do good things. As I said before, disobeying God is called sin. And the penalty for sin is death, spiritual death, spending eternity without God's presence. We must be saved from the penalty of sin. Salvation is a gift of grace, and if we truly are in Christ, we will never be refused entry to heaven. God's grace covers all our fears, all our imperfections, all our failures, and doubts. But what is grace? The grace of God is truly the source of every blessing throughout history. But what is grace? It can be defined as undeserved or unearned favor of God toward us. We cannot earn it by ourselves. We deserve nothing. If I, to I, I told you before that the laws of God is an indication of who He is and His holiness. There's no way that we in our sinful nature can ever think that a day will go by that we will not sin at all. So because of our sin, we are not worthy of appearing before God and pride ourselves of righteousness and obedience to the law. We can earn nothing. We can claim nothing. But God pours out His blessing on us because of His grace. He truly is a God of love and forgiveness and mercy. But if He does not choose to show His love and forgiveness to us through grace, we will be lost forever. Then we spoke of Adam and Eve and how Adam and Eve immediately died spiritually and began to die physically. But by grace, God had promised them that one of their descendants would come and provide a way back to God. And he will pay the ultimate penalty for their sin and provide salvation. Genesis 3. But sin became more and more and also more evil. So God decided to destroy everything on earth by sending a flood. And the only living creatures that were saved was Noah and his family and the animals on the ark. But after that, when the people multiplied again, they decided to build a high tower so that they can reach the heavens and be higher than God. So God confused their speech and gave them different languages and then scattered them all over the earth. God then also limited his saving mostly to one man and his descendants. And that man was Abraham. And the Bible tells us that Abraham became the father of all believers. Romans 4. So God chose to reveal his plan of salvation to Abraham and his descendants. Through Abraham, God would bless the whole world not just Abraham and his descendants. A child would be born in the line of Abraham, and this child would be the savior of the whole world. This will be God's own son who was born as a human on earth. 
He was born to Mary, a young virgin in Bethlehem, the city of David, in the land of Israel. Now, just for interest, you will remember that Jacob had a struggle with God one night, and after the struggle, God renamed him to Israel. So the people of Israel are the descendants of Jacob, who was renamed by God to Israel. And the country Israel is then the land of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. So the people of Israel were God's people promised to Abraham, and through this nation, the Savior would be born. The child was named Jesus. In Hebrew, Yeshua means the Lord saves. Because through this child, God would save his people through penalty, from their penalty of their sin. Matthew 1.21 God called Abraham to leave his home in the land of Ar, of the Chaldeans, which is today known as an area in Iraq. So God made a promise to Abraham and said, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12. Wow. But why did God choose Abraham for this blessing? We do not read of a long list of achievements. Nothing that Abraham did could earn it. Many would say that Abraham was a random man chosen by God to fulfill this great promise. But if you trace the lineage, you see something different. We do know that Abraham can be traced back to Shem, the son of Noah, and I believe that the story of God was passed down from generation to generation through Shem. It was Shem's brother Ham who strayed from their father's teaching. Nevertheless, Abraham was not free from sin. We read in Joshua 24, Then Joshua spoke to all the people and he said, I am telling you what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to you. A long time ago, your ancestors lived on the other side of the Euphrates River. I am talking about men like Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor. At that time, they worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham out of the land on the other side of the river, and I led him through the land of Canaan and gave him many children. I gave Abraham his son Isaac. And then we read in verse 15, But maybe you don't want to serve the Lord. You must choose for yourselves today. Today you must decide who you will serve. Will you serve the gods that your ancestors worshipped when they lived on the other side of the Euphrates River? Or will you serve the gods of the Amorites who lived in this land? You must choose for yourselves. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. So, we do not see that Abraham was free of sin and lived a righteous life. But we do see in verse 2 that Abraham's father and the other men worshipped other gods. So I believe that Bible scholars automatically assume that Abraham and his brother Nahor also worshipped other gods. But here's something that you do not hear every day. Abraham is the grandfather of Jacob, the son of Isaac. This would make him the great-grandfather of Joseph and his brothers. Now remember that the lineage of Jesus came through Joseph's brother Judah, who, was also, who also prepared to sacrifice himself so that his brothers can go free. Now Abraham's brother Nahor remained in the land. So let's go off topic for a bit, shall we? And we go to Job 1 verse 1. There was a man named Job who lived in the country of Oz. He was a good and honest man. He respected God and refused to do evil. Job had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 1,000 oxen, 500 female donkeys. He had many servants and he was the richest man in the east. Now, remember when we spoke of the nation of Israel, I told you that the people as a nation is named after their father, Jacob, or Israel. Now, let's get back to Job. He lived in the land of Uz. Let's call them the Uzians. Now, some, same as with Israel, the Uzians are descendants of Uz, the son of, Nahor's, uh, the son of Nahor, Abraham's brother. So Job is a descendant of Nahor and most likely the cousin of Joseph. 
So I firmly believe that the story of God was passed down from generation to generation and that Job knew God, even if he did not, uh, even if he lived in a land full of unbelievers. So even if Terah, the father of Abram and Hayor, served other gods, our God made sure that the story of creation and the fall of man is passed on. So back to Abraham. Even if Abraham maybe did not serve God at the time God spoke to him, he did know about God. And we can trace the lineage of Jesus all the way through Abraham to Noah and to Adam. So Abraham left the land of Ar, the land of his father, and he went to Canaan, as God instructed him. Because Abraham had faith, Abraham trusted God. And it was because of that strong faith that he continued to trust God and obey God throughout his life, even when his faith was continuously challenged and tested. This strong faith in God is the reason he is called the father of all believers in the New Testament. Believers are people who trust God, believe his promises and obey his commands. So, what we can say about Abraham, or what can we say about Abraham, the father of our people? What did, he, what did he learn about faith? If Abraham was right by the things he did, he had a reason to boast about himself. But God knew different. That's why the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and because of this, he, accept, he was accepted as one who was right with God. When people work, their pay is not given to them as a gift. They earn the pay they get. But people cannot do any work that will make them right with God. So they must trust in Him. Then He accepts their faith and that makes them right with Him. He is the one who makes even evil people right. David said the same thing when he was talking about the blessing people have when God accepted them as good without looking at what they have done. It is a blessing when people are forgiven for the wrongs they have done, when their sins are erased. It is a great blessing when the Lord accepts people as if they are without sin. Is this blessing only for those who are circumcised? Or is it also for those who are not circumcised? We have already said that it was because of Abraham's faith that he was accepted as one who is right with God. So, how did that happen? Did God accept Abraham before or after he was circumcised? God accepted him before his circumcision. Abraham was circumcised later to show that God accepted him. And his circumcision was proof that he was right with God through faith before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the father of all those who believe but are not circumcised. They believe and are accepted as people who are right with God. And Abraham is also the father of those who have been circumcised. But it is not their circumcision that makes him their father. He is their father only if they live following the faith that our father Abraham had before the circumcision. Abraham and his descendants received the promise that they would get the whole world. But Abraham did not receive that promise because he followed the law. He received that promise because he was right with God through his faith. If the people could get God's promise by following the law, then faith is worthless. And if God's promise to Abraham is worthless because the law can only bring God's anger on those who disobey it. But if there's no law, then there's nothing to disobey. People, so people get what God promised by faith. This happens so that the promise can be a free gift. And even if the promise is a free gift, then all of Abraham's people will get that promise. The promise is not just for those who live under the law of Moses. It is for all who live with faith as Abraham did. He is the father of us all. As the scriptures say, I have made you a father of many nations. This is true before God, the one Abraham believed, the God who gives life to the dead and speaks 
of things that don't yet exist as if they are real. There was no hope that Abraham would have children, but Abraham believed God and continued to hope. That is why he became the father of many nations. As God told him, you will have many descendants. So Abraham was almost a hundred years old and he was past the age of having children. Also Sarah who could not have children. Abraham was well aware of this, but his faith in God never became weak. He never doubted that God would do what he promised and he never stopped believing. In fact, he grew stronger in his faith and just praised God. Abraham felt sure that God was able to do what he promised. So that's why he was accepted as one who is right with God. These words, he was accepted, were written not only for Abraham. They were also written for us. God will also accept us because we believe. We believe in the one who raised Jesus, our Lord, from death. Jesus was handed over to die for our sins and he was raised from death to make us right in God. And that was the whole chapter 4 of Romans. So when God called Abraham, he promised to bless him and his descendants, but also to bless those who bless Abraham and to curse those who curse him. Genesis 12. This promise was not only for Abraham's personal gain, but God's promise of the Savior that would come through his lineage. So any nation who protected or blessed Abraham would receive special blessing from God. But those who oppose Abraham or his descendants and thereby interfered with God's plans for redemption would be cursed. And they would face condemnation and destruction. So God graciously protected his people and kept them safe by blessing those who helped Abraham's people and were generous toward them. But destroying those who opposed God's chosen people. And by this, God continued to carry out his divine plan to redeem the nations of the world through them. And you can read the whole history of the people of Israel in the book of Joshua and Judges in the light of God's purpose and plan. So God blessed Abraham and his descendants in many ways. But God's ultimate purpose was to bless the whole world through Abraham. God would bless the whole world and provide a savior for all who believed in him. John 3.16 So the ultimate purpose will be fulfilled regardless of Satan who seek to destroy Abraham's descendants by causing them to disobey and to deny and distrust their God. The people of Israel were called to live lives of faith and holiness as examples to the rest of the world. They alone had God's promises and God's laws and they were called to demonstrate to the rest of the world what it means to live as children of the one true God. But they could not always do that. They still can't. Now, God had never promised that all Abraham's descendants would be obedient and faithful. They were not. They often lived unholy and selfish and disobedient and proud lives, far away from God. They forgot God many times. And they chose to worship other gods. And when they did, God punished them. Just like He punished other nations who opposed them. But when Israel turned back to God and repented, God forgave them through grace. But God was always faithful to his ultimate purpose to provide a redeemer to the world through them regardless of their disobedience. So next week we will dig deeper into Abraham's faith and God's covenant. I will see you there. Let's pray. Our Father, we glorify your holy name. The whole of creation sing your praises. The stars and the planets shout out your name, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Thank you for providing a way out of sin and into eternal life with you. Thank you for your grace, regardless of our sins. Forgive us, sometimes choosing to go the other way, away from your word, and fill us with your Holy Spirit, so that we want to be faithful. 
Teach us your ways. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. May God, the source of hope, fill you completely with joy and shalom in the week to come as you continue trusting and continue seeking Him so that by the power of Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, you may overflow with hope. Grace to you and shalom from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen.